continue here. Um, we should look at this, this Doppler shift uh, also in the slow velocity, in the non-relativistic limit. So if we have beta much less than 1, so if we're moving with a speed much less than speed of light. So if beta is almost 0, then of course gamma is the first order approximate to 1. So in that case, and let's just look at the forward uh, direction, so mu is equals 1. So so is moving straight at you at non relativistic speed. Then the received energy is approximately, we look at the gamma then, E emitted over 1 minus beta mu. And the first order Taylor expansion, if the beta is very small, gives you E emitted plus uh, okay so that means if we write this in terms of e received minus e emitted over E emitted, so that means the energy shift over the original energy is then to first order, just beta times mu, beta mu is, so beta times mu is, beta mu is beta cosine theta, so this is E over C times cosine theta received, or what that is, that is the component of the velocity that is along our line of sight. So this is the component parallel to our line of sight, and often writes that as B parallel over C. So that means component <coughs> of B that is parallel to the line of sound. So the velocity, the component of the velocity that's directed straight to the And I'm sure this is something that you've already seen for the non relativistic Doppler shift. So V is much less than C, then the energy, the relative energy change is simply V parallel over C. I'm sure you can see that. Okay, now we've calculated our Doppler shift here considering the emission frame velocity momentum. Obviously, we should be able to do the same gain if we take the velocity of the receiver's frame dot photon momentum, right? Obviously, that should be constant as well. Shouldn't matter which velocity we, we choose then. We have two properly defined four vectors. If you do that, then things become trivial here on the receiver side. So on this side, we simply get energy in the receiver's frame. And on the other side, we get the same here with gamma e in the emitter's frame. But Beta now goes in the opposite direction. So the plus turns into a minus. So we have minus in the gram. So what we get is 1 plus beta dot k in the emitter frame. Right? So that also means that E receiver is E emitted gamma 1 plus beta times mu emitted. <coughs> now, but these two better be the same, right? We have our Doppler shift considering this, and we have another expression for the Doppler shift considering that. And those two look kind of different, don't they? One over 
gamma 1 minus beta mu and times gamma 1 plus beta mu. Generally, it was about the same. Right? What does that tell us? That's the last thing we'll, we'll derive today. If this is the same as this, 1 over gamma 1 minus beta mu, then we have the angle with respect to the x-axis in the receiver's frame, the angle with respect to the x-axis in the emitter's frame. For these two to be the same, these angles cannot be the same. Right? And that is what gives us relativistic aberration. So, we want, if we haven't done any nonsense here, obviously we're talking about the same energies in both expressions. So, 1 over gamma 1 minus beta mu in the receiver's frame equals gamma 1 plus beta mu in the Then let's maybe solve this for new receivers. So that means 1 minus beta mu in the receiver's frame. So here equals 1 over gamma squared 1 plus mu in the emitter's frame. Right? 1 over gamma squared plus 1 minus beta squared. So that means beta mu mu in the receiver's frame is beta mu over this here is one minus one minus beta squared over plus beta mu meter's frame, which is So forward stays forward, 
backward space backward. But let's say mu emitters equals zero. So let's consider a photon that is emitted in our frame here at a right angle. So this would be mu emitted equals zero. The angle is 90 degrees, the cosine is zero. So then, what we get? Then we have mu in the receiver's frame equals, that is zero, is beta over one is zero. So it's just beta. And so if beta is a small angle, if beta is close to one, cosine theta is close to one, that means in the co-moving frame, I've already shown that here, in the co-moving frame actually mu received equals beta. So things that in some moving frame are emitted by the angles to our direction of motion are actually all twisted in the forward direction. And that also means if you can look at everything towards half sphere in the forward direction from plus to minus 90 degrees will be ending up in a little cone of this kind. So that's the fundamental of relativistic aberration, which the half of the radiation that's emitted anywhere will be beamed into a little cone that has this opening angle of, of beta. Now, if we make the assumption here, so if beta is, is almost one, just a little bit less than one, that also means that cosine theta is almost one, so theta must be a very small angle, right? Theta of zero is exactly one. So if we have a very small angle for, for theta in the receiver's frame, almost, uh, so very small, then what is cosine theta to first order? What's the first order, the lowest order Taylor expansion of the cosine? One, right, cosine zero is one. Minus, okay. minus theta squared over two, right? But, so this is about beta. Beta you can solve. So if gamma is 1 over square root 1 minus beta squared, you can say beta, solve this for beta, is square root 1 minus 1 over gamma squared. And well, if gamma is much larger than 1, 1 over gamma squared is very small. So to first order, this is 1 minus 1 over 2 gamma squared. So that means if the source is moving relativistically, well, we have the one here and here, and then we have the first order term with the opening angle of this code into which half the radiation is beamed compared to this. So it tells you that essentially the theta received is to first order one over. So that means if your source of light of radiation is moving with large Lorentz factor gamma, everything ends up in a narrow cone here of opening and or from over. And that will be very important for relativistic astrophysics. We have actually sources moving relativistically. And then if, if we happen to look at it from this small angle here, we see the source much brighter than it actually is because everything is bunched up in the forward direction. So then this headlight that the radiation goes into the small fold. Good, that's all we wanted to derive. Probably don't have time to see the movie all the way to the end, but at least another couple minutes. Any questions before we switch to continuing the movie? Actually, we'll back up a little bit to where we already were last time because some of this relativistic aberration was already in the movie that we haven't discussed yet. Okay, then enjoy.
may have noticed how the clocks on the lens jet appear to warp as we start to move and more so the faster we went. This is the result of the finite light speed that makes the picture appear distorted. This is sometimes referred to as the aberration of light. It's somewhat analogous to driving through rain. Even if rain is falling down, it will appear to someone in a moving car to fall at an angle, striking the windshield from ahead. Light, of course, is coming at us from all directions, not just from above, but once we are moving, most of it appears to come from the head. The result is to distort the picture we have of objects outside by crowding them together ahead of us. Another phenomenon is the sensation of lurching backwards before starting to move forwards at the beginning of the journey. You surely noticed this in our previous experiment. If we replay the first few moments in slow motion, you can see that the car appears to move backwards. In fact, the start sign comes into view a little before proceeding forwards, whereas it was previously hidden. This occurs because when we accelerate, we encounter light that was emitted from sources that were hidden from us before we began to move. As you can see in this illustration, light from the point at the top of the start sign is not getting to the driver's eyes when he is stationary. As he starts to move forward, some of the light which previously went over him is now brushing the top of his head, briefly coming down to high level. In this world, light's substantial travel time has strange consequences. Now we take the car to an imaginary city with towering buildings and uniformly straight in level blocks. All cross streets that we will encounter are perpendicular to our path, a fact which would be important to remember later on. We'll increase speed slowly to show how quickly the effects of this aberration of light manifest themselves. Notice how the cross streets no longer appear straight, but bend away from us, and the buildings appear to bend. And yet the curve of parallel to our path is still as straight as can be. The leading sides of the buildings no longer appear at right angles to the street front, but are angled away from us, forming sharp corners. Look at this open space, a park to our right. It does appear to be a rectangular cross at all. Taking a glance behind us, we notice that everything looks a little bigger and appears to move much more so than did the street in front of us. We now enter the tunnel. You will encounter several of these along the journey. And note that we are now travelling 27 kilometers per hour, as fast as we dared to go in the last experiment. <coughs> Let's accelerate and go further into the red. Suppose we place a net curve down the center of one of the cross streets. 
we can burst through this without damage. Now we get back in the car. Purple object up ahead is the curve. Recording one second for every four 